So this next section of the podcast will be me trying to connect the dots. No one really knows the answer here, but these are some of my ideas and some of the literature that I think might support those hypotheses and or ideas. So this is a very interesting study looking at the role of um, undigested food and the gut microbiome possibly cooperating in the pathogenesis of neuroinflammatory diseases, a matter of barriers and a proposal on the origin of organ specificity. This is an interesting paper from October of 2019. They say gut dysbiosis, which is a fancy word for the overgrowth of the wrong type of bacteria. And I'll read it again. Gut dysbiosis as a consequence of Western diets, which is an interesting fraught statement, leads to intestinal inflammation and a leaky intestinal barrier. I think that's a pretty reasonable statement. As I talked about in my book, The Carnivore Code, no one really knows what aspect of those Western diets lead to this, but it's pretty clear that a Western diet will lead to intestinal inflammation and a leaky intestinal barrier and gut dysbiosis in many individuals, but life is about having fun. So you should just drink a beer and eat your kale and not ask questions. This is why this pisses me off so much, guys. There are people suffering. We know that Western diets are a problem. Let's ask questions and understand what it is about these diets that is causing issues for people so that people may stop fucking suffering. Gut dysbiosis, as a consequence of Western diets, leads to intestinal inflammation and a leaky intestinal barrier. The efflux, which is the movement of undigested food, microbes, and the toxins like lipoproteins, um, the, the efflux of undigested food, microbes, and the toxins, as well as immune competent cells and molecules, causes chronic systemic inflammation. So what they're talking about is the movement of all of these things, either across the gut lining, because you know that very adjacent to the endothelium of the gut, the inner layer of your gut that separates tons and tons of poop and bacteria and undigested, undigested food from your immune system, which live in the lamen appropria, which is a level which is a, a layer of your immune system, a layer of cells that is wrapped around the gut, okay? The movement of undigested food, microbes and endotoxins, as well as immune competent cells and molecules between those two places causes chronic systemic inflammation. I think that's a very reasonable hypothesis. I think we see that being played out. And I think that the gut is ground zero for much of, the, much of this. And I think that the gut is ground zero for much of this. They go on to say, opening of the blood-brain barrier may trigger microglia. Those are those... These are the brain-derived macrophages, the brain-derived immune cells. It may trigger those cells and astrocytes and set up neuroinflammation. I think this is a very reasonable hypothesis. And so we are back to the gut. And I think the gut is the main place, the ground zero for all of this happening. The next section is called chronic neurodegenerative diseases are associated with low-grade chronic, chronic inflammation. We know this. It's all quite clear. The question is, where is it coming from? As they say here, I think it's quite reasonable that it could be coming from dysbiosis, the gut, et cetera. And then the question becomes, how do we do that? How do we affect that negatively? How do we affect it positively? We'll get to my ideas about that in just one moment. One more paper, the role of the gut microbiome, immunity, and neuroinflammation in the pathology, in the pathophysiology of eating disorders. So this is back to eating disorders. They say here, there's a growing recognition that both the gut microbiome and the immune system are involved in a number of psychiatric illnesses, including eating disorders. Yes, I would agree with that statement. It should come as no surprise given the important roles of diet composition, eating patterns, and daily caloric intake in modulating both biological systems. Here, we review the evidence that alterations in the gut microbiome and immune system may serve not only to maintain and exacerbate dysregulated eating behavior, characterized by caloric restriction in anorexia, in anorexia nervosa or binge eating in bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder, but may also serve as biomarkers of increased risk for developing an eating disorder. I think this is a great little review if you want to dig into this. And you can see that they say, similar to um, anorexia nervosa, highly effective treatments for bulimic syndromes, including bulimia and binge eating disorder are lacking because we don't really have a good understanding of how to characterize and then perhaps reverse this neuroinflammation or where it's coming from. They go on to say, the last few years have, however, led to a growing recognition that both the gut microbiome and the immune system are involved in a number of psychiatric illnesses, including eating disorders. You can see from this table in the same paper that there's an examination of the gut microbiome and anorexia nervosa and animal models of anorexia nervosa. Multiple papers which show changes in the microbiome um, in anorexia nervosa, decreased alpha diversity, increase, increased clostridial species, increased enterobacteriaceae, et cetera, et cetera, decreased alpha diversity. These are all essentially characteristic of dysbiosis. So we can talk about how all this happens in a moment. 
Uh, they go on, they show many of these are changing um, with those conditions. And then they have other studies later on in this paper where they suggest summary of peripheral and central immune changes in anorexia nervosa and animal models of anorexia nervosa. There are multiple papers, decreased neutrophil chemotaxis, reduction in granulocyte ability to kill bacteria, increased pro-inflammatory cytokines, IL-6, the IL-1 beta, and uh, TNF-alpha, like we saw in depression, increased, increased pro-inflammatory cytokine, TNF-alpha, um, IL-15, VKM-1, IL-6, dysregulated T-cell subtypes, decreased levels of IgM and IgG antibodies, increased pro-inflammatory eicosanoids. So there's a lot of information here. There's a lot of evidence that there is inflammation, neuroinflammation in patients with these eating disorders, but they don't really get treated that way. We don't really ask these questions too often. The same is seen in bulimia, nervosa, binge eating disorders, and animal models of those diseases. So I think that what we're starting to see here is a really interesting rabbit hole to fall down and beginning to ask questions. Okay, if there is neuroinflammation in these conditions, how do we treat it? and what is causing it.